everybody. Uh, welcome to the good morning to the people on the West Coast, to uh, the people in the central zone here, and to the many people from Europe and Norway and Denmark and Spain and from all over. Uh, this is our regular rabbit hole meeting, and we're just going to sort of open it up, just give you the sort of the rules that we use here. At the bottom of your window, you're going to see a, uh, a chat box. Um, what we usually do, and it seems to work pretty good the last couple of times, is that if you want to talk, and it's up to you what you want to talk about, I guess. Um, put in there a message to Desta. You'll see Desta Barnaby, who is the host here. Um, put your name in there that you want to talk, and then we go uh, one after another through uh, the various people. We try to keep it to like uh, a couple of minutes. Um, at the end, if you, you know, you can you can go back in more than one time. But rather than having someone talk for 15 or 20 minutes, because we have uh, almost 50 people on here again. Uh, so put your questions in there and maybe you can sort of uh, right to start is people put sort of their location or if they want to say because I know where people are sort of stop. Um, Okay, and at the bottom uh, you we would suggest that you stay muted Desta usually mutes people So if you see yourself as muted we do that because um, if your husband or wife starts to argue with you uh, It's going to be on the screen. It, it pops up. So if you have your your audio off uh, your screen won't pop up or if you're typing or something you'll you don't know but you're, you're gonna come up on the screen because it's it's voice activated um, Mark is here mark uh, maybe we can start with you we have an event on Tuesday night that everybody here will get an invite to um, and uh, what we've done is we started to go online we've done this for Destin I've done this for maybe four or five years we started we started in Denver or Boulder, Colorado for the first rabbit hole, which is probably going back five years. So we've been online for quite a while doing this kind of stuff, but um, some of the groups in America, because of the COVID thing, have gone online. And Mark Olson, who's here with us today, uh, is running the Winnipeg UFO group. And uh, we are going to host a meeting for them on Tuesday night. We're gonna bring in Ron Johnson, who has one of the most paranormal stories that I've ever heard in 45 years. I've done a number of interviews with him. Uh, in fact, I did just another one the other night about his um, his very bizarre Sasquatch story. But Mark, can you come on here and basically describe the group and um, what we're going to be doing Tuesday night and give an invite to anybody who wants to uh, join us to watch this um, interview. We're going to extend it interview we're going to do with Ron Johnson. Well, yeah, thanks, Grant. And thanks for hosting this particular event because I was in it last week for the first time and find it very informative. Obviously, a lot of passionate people in this group, and I'm very excited to uh, to sort of say Ron is going to join us on Tuesday night, which is uh, which starts at seven o'clock Central Time. Um, we're part of a group uh, at to actually Grant and I and two other people uh, started some six years ago. Grant, uh, time just flies by. Uh, we have uh, 760 members now um, that are we're a city of about 750,000 people but our members are all over the world. Uh, we don't charge uh, for people to come and watch. We have a Zoom presentation as a part of our presentation. We usually meet in person, and it's, uh, it's like a self-help group. It started as a self-help group and sort of a chance for people that were interested in so many different things. You know, a lot of people came into the meeting thinking, you know, I, I'm interested in UFOs, but they don't necessarily, uh, they're in kindergarten in the experience concept. Uh, and then, then we have people that are university professors that have been abducted at fly, fly, fly craft. They, uh, a lot of, a lot of quite amazing stuff. I know a number of people, I don't suspect people in this particular group are falling off their chairs when they hear that. But, um, Grant and I have been very fortunate to have had people that we have met with personally that describe the experiences and do these sort of things, meetings, but personally face to face that have been, you know, quite remarkable. Uh, so this group that we set up is basically to share information. Um, we have uh, we have guests that come in from all over the world um, and spare none. Probably a lot of the people that you would all know anyways that are a major part of Grant's sort of our conduit. He's uh, he's our booking agent for a lot of people <laughs> that he can get access to. So uh, it's a fabulous thing to, um, to sit and enjoy. Although I know if you're talking about uh, in Europe, 7 o'clock start central time is probably two o'clock in the morning. Um, we're gonna plan, if you go to our site, it's it's off of uh, Meetup, 
And uh, if, if you go meet up uh, Winnipeg UFO researchers uh, and experiencers, you'll find our group. You can put your name in there. Uh, you subscribe just by putting in your email address, you know, sign up, put your email address, and we send out an invitation uh, to the meeting. And it'll include a Zoom invitation as well. So you can tune in to that particular thing. And Ron Johnson, and I actually, Grant sent me these last interview that they did with them. Um, quite spectacular. Anyways, that's more than two minutes, but um, uh, we're looking forward to having you. We're, I'm very interested in, in, uh, in our May meeting, which is uh, people who yeah, speak talk about that. languages. Tell a bit a little bit about that. Linda is on here. One of the speakers yeah. who's going to be on is, is on yeah, here today. So Linda is uh, actually, I'm not sure if you can see her, that's the, uh, the woman in purple that uh, she's down there in Arizona. Uh, become a very good friend of mine, um, is very gifted, has, uh, speaks, I'm not sure how many languages actually, Linda, you could speak to this pretty close, better than I could, but she's part of, hopefully, I'm not sure, Grant, how many we do have that we're looking at having, about six people that speak these light languages, and uh, hopefully talk about providing messaging, providing uh, some examples of these light languages, and I think even people who speak these languages will start to, will come in and maybe even participate. I suspect there's more than six in the world. So um, it's gonna be, I think, a very interesting, uh, I think it's May the 14th, I think, Grant? Yeah, second Tuesday of, of, of the month. Right. So anyways, Linda, you can say hi. Yeah. We have to unmute Linda. You're muted. <laughs> Hello, everyone. I'm Linda. Hope to see you on May 12th and uh, answer any questions you have and definitely give you some demonstration of light language really actually quite beautiful and can mean a lot to people. It, it talks to their higher self and to the heart and soul. So you understand what it says to you intuitively and it can be healing and grounding and activating. So hope you join us. Thanks, Linda. And what, what, Linda, before you go, what, what, what do you interpret light language to be? Why is this going on? Because light I, language it has been going on for, for a long time. That's a wonderful question. I believe it's because our consciousness is raised so much and our vibration is raised so much because this sort of came to me really spontaneously. And I didn't actually understand it at first. And I think the reason it's coming to us is that we're starting to come back to who we are. We're remembering who we really are, which isn't maybe necessarily just from this planet even. I think a lot of us are feeling that way. Um, so I think that's part of the reason I've been told it's, it's got this healing effect and we're all waking up and remembering who we are and to become more and more of a collective, a, a unity, a one. So I think that's part of the reason and, and the light language is part of the activation for you to remember who you are. Yeah, it's, right. it's pretty spectacular stuff when you see it. And, and we all have, I believe, six um, light language people on from around the world. Mostly women, only, we may have one man, but so far it's all women, which that may mean something, I don't know. They're better communicators, Grant. <laughs> yeah, a little, little more right-brained. They're, they're, they're here to save the world from, from us men. Yeah, I know one man. I know one other man who has light language. Okay, so if we can invite him, because maybe we can sort of- I will, I'll him. ask him if he wants to. I would love yeah. to do that. Beautiful. Uh, one other person I'd like to bring up is Hildegard from Toronto. Um, we started the Experiencer Anonymous group in Winnipeg to give a, a place for people to come and tell their stories without being laughed at. And I, um, a number of years ago, I was talking in Toronto and Hildegard uh, volunteered to run the Toronto group. So uh, can you come on, Hildegard, and talk about your group? You're also running yours online now as well, correct? I'm, yeah. on. I'm back. Yes. Okay. We are here, thank you to you encouraging me to open my mouth in 2016 because I was never going to speak about this ever again. The experience was not fun. The consequences of me talking about having been with Andromedans was really serious. And so I decided not to talk about it ever again. I'm glad I'm doing it because since I've been doing it, I have wonderful people come towards me. One of my friends, Carl, is on here as well. Linda Green, thank you very much. And of course, everybody connected in Winnipeg with um, Grant, because it made the experience real for me. After talking for 15 minutes, I was encouraged. 
by the one man I know speaks language, a light language, which is Mark Sonson. And I'm not sure if you have that man in mind, Linda, but he said to me, you got to speak it. And I'm saying, over my dead body, I'm not going to do it. But now I know how important it is. And I'm glad you're building up the confidence to say something. So thank you for being there and giving me that opportunity grant. And thanks to all of you for letting me be a part of this. I really appreciate you all. Thank you. Beautiful. I remember, I think that was in Brantford. Was it you and what's the guy's name? Brad? Max Hornson. Mark, Mark. Yeah, I remember you. It was we had the remember we had the experience your day was on the Friday and then they had the lectures on the Saturday and Sunday morning. And I remember you and him standing there talking this light language and I'm going, What the heck is going on? You were on stage both talking back and forth. It was the it was the most what, impressive. If thing. I may just throw this out for a second. I never met Mark before. Somebody suggested that I was doing interviews with people on a local online TV station. And one of my guests who I interviewed had said, I should connect with this person who is like three, 400 kilometers north of Toronto. And I said, okay, so I called him. And then he said, well, I just want you to know that I can go with you on that ship with your quote unquote handler, Louis Mar. And I'm saying, right, I've never done that before. That sounds really crazy. I don't know what you're smoking. And he said to me, how about you talk to him the way you talk to him telepathically? You ask for permission for me to come along. And then the two of us go and see what's up there. And then we see what happens. So I'm sitting here talking on the phone and I recorded it on my laptop, by the way. Wow. And so I would communicate with Louis Marr. And then Mark would start talking some gibberish. Whatever. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what kind of a lunatic have I drawn? Like I was really scared of this. You've got to understand this. My left brain is not wanting to go there. I just wanted a normal life. Anyway, after all of this was over, I asked Mark just to verify whether it was true what had shaken down. I said, I want you to describe where we just were. Give me the picture. Describe the windows. And he described what I perceive to be concave windows. And I was blown away. And then months later, we met when he said, I want you to come with me to this alien cosmic meeting. And I refused. I said, no way, I'm not going to go. Anyway, later on more. Thanks again for giving me the opportunity to speak. I appreciate it. Bye-bye. Can I hey. weigh in here unannounced? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I, in 1976, I had what was commonly come to know as a Pentecostal experience. Oh, yeah. And in it, I was, of course, visited by a UFO. And... <clears throat> And one of the aspects of that experience ultimately led to me uh, what they call speaking in tongues, yeah. speaking in foreign languages. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there's a whole plethora of publications and uh, audio tapes and teachings on the phenomena of speaking in tongues as an aspect of the gift, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And uh, <clears throat> I'm just wondering if maybe that's not coming into play here. Uh, it's, it's interesting you bring that up, Greg, because um, there's a girl, I don't think she's on. She's got a master's degree, uh, um, got a master's degree. She contacted me to do a study. That's part of the study that we may try to do. And that is to um, look at um, light language people because the people who've spoken in tongues They've actually put them in MRI machines, the same as people who are praying, uh, people who are doing um, uh, meditation, people who are doing mediumship. And what they were able to determine is that uh, they produce a certain brain pattern. So if you, you can actually go and say, you say you're a medium, okay, go inside the MRI, you should be able to produce this brain pattern. If you're not producing the brain pattern, every other medium produces, well, then you're probably not uh, doing mediumship. So this has been done, it used to be done at the University of Philadelphia. And that was one of the questions that, that came up that we want to study. So they've done people speaking in tongues and we want to, we're going to try to 
arrange, I don't know how we're going to do it, but we're going to try to arrange to get someone speaking light language in the MRI machine and see if it's the, uh, we have the same sort of brain pattern. Because I think it may be related. I think you're, you're, you're speaking. Because what you get is you get this sort of very high energy situation in Pentecostal churches. And that's the same sort of energy that you will produce in a physical mediumship uh, seance and that you will in a C5 thing, like a Mission Rama thing, where they're raising the vibration. And once you raise the vibration, you sort of break through the veil and all kinds of weirdness starts to happen where you're outside the conscious mind. Yeah, I, I, I agree, would agree with that. You know, ultimately, <clears throat> I, I, of course, was prompted to begin to speak in tongues. And that's one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And then the other one, is uh, the interpretation of tongues. Yeah. And so it struck me that Hildegrad was, uh, you know, conscious of uh, the ability to understand the strange tongue spoken to her when she, ver when the, when she interacted with somebody that seemed to say the same thing. Uh, yeah. So, it, you know, and it comes also as words of knowledge, but they're all gifts of uh, healing and discernment and all that good stuff. And it's a, it's a difficult road to hoe because the world at large ain't going to be on the same page with you. Yeah. Although I think it'll be, it's a matter of raising consciousness where eventually there's going to be so much of this discussion that people will eventually say almost like they did when the, when the uh, New York Times article came out. Yeah, I knew the UFOs were being done by the government. I knew that already. We, we always thought that everybody's going to jump off a bridge and, you know, religion would collapse and stuff. And absolutely nothing happened at all once it became, because people are being acclimatized. And that's what I think it comes down to is that the more we talk about it, because I didn't know about this until Mary Rodwell came on, actually in the Winnipeg group, we brought Winni Mary Rodwell on from Australia and she's going to be one of the six panel members. And she's got these young kids, six, six seven, eight, nine years old, who speak this, this, uh, this light language. And she played these tapes. And I was sort of blown away. And then we were looking around the room in Winnipeg. And there was two people in the room who knew what she was talking about. And I'm going, you, you know what's going on here? And it's like, yeah. And I, I was just sort of blown away. I didn't know that this thing, and I've been around this field for a long time. I didn't know. It's almost like it's sort of emerged now. Linda, maybe you can speak. Can you open your mic again? I want to ask you a question because uh, Greg brought up the fact that um, some people can read it. And this is where Sinead and I are going to do an interview with a woman by the name of Tiffany Tin out of uh, Toronto. And she just uh, produced a video where she's talking about um, um, the felines people uh, from, I can't remember what the system they're from, star system. But she's talking about them and the light language. And we, we, uh, there's an interview that's about to go up on my YouTube channel. Uh, Tress uh, Blair, you'll see, and she actually does light language on there, and she is in contact with the feline people. So you, you start seeing all these connections, like all these, suddenly all right. these feline people are coming to me, and, and what we hear is that some people can read it, some people can write it, some people can interpret it, some people can do all of it, but some people can only sing it, some people can only write it. <laughs> and so, Linda, maybe you can speak to that. Can you read, write, uh, understand? I can not understand it exactly, no. It's more like it's a, a grounding and has an activation. And um, actually, if anybody know who Cryon is, I directly asked Cryon about this you know, phenomenon of people, I didn't tell him I had it, uh, speaking a light language. And he said that Cryon says that the old tools on the planet are no longer working for healers. And that light, Cryon says that light language is the new tool on the planet and it's exploding. And, and that's what you're finding, Grant, that this light language is exploding and that it ha contains large packets of information in small, concise things. So you're not always going to be like, here's what I'm saying and here's how it interprets. Like, here's the three words that I just said. It's gonna be more like you just got a download you just got information that's impacting you on a cellular level. You just got something much bigger than a translation. So you've gotten something bigger than that. And why some people can draw and why some people can talk, I have no clue. That's part of our uncovering the rabbit hole. I have no clue. I have no clue why I can do it or why it started or why it gives me such comfort. Uh, and, and why one comes, one language comes out sometimes, and another language comes out sometimes, 
or why I want to sing sometimes. <laughs> I just don't know. So it's a, it's a still a mystery to me, and I, I learn from everybody as I go along. Well, from my experience, Linda, uh, I, let me just offer that um, the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, fall where they may. It, it's where the, the, the Spirit blows where it willeth. And, um, and one should not expect to be able to interpret things unless they're anointed to do so. In other words, like they get a, some kind of a sensation or impression, a, a download, if you want to call it that, that, they, that uh, they're being given an interpretation. And, uh, and these gifts are meant to function in communities. So Mark, with your group there in Winnipeg, uh, you might expect a hell of a revival going on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Grant, do you mind if I just yeah, put yeah. a few cents here? Because there's yeah. some additional color to yeah. the story here. I asked uh, Linda, when I, when I first met Linda, um, we have a, a friend in my a mutual friend, Don, that um, we, we appeared early at the UFO Congress early in the morning to go to the experience session, which runs from eight to nine. And it's people getting up talking about their experiences, which is a really interesting part of the, of the whole uh, UFO Congress. Anyways, um, we saw Linda coming in and he waved her over and wanted to introduce me to her. And uh, I, I'd never heard a light language before. So I asked, Linda, can you give us some, some examples of it? And she said, sure. And she turned over to Don. She started speaking to Don. And tears started flowing down her face as she was talking. So I, I mean, I was, it was quite an interesting moment in my life to actually experience it. Um, I met Linda about a month later after the Congress, and we went for coffee. And I asked her if she could bring a message to me. Uh, in this light language, and I, if you would permit me, permit me to record it, which I did, and she did deliver the message, which is about two minutes long, and I sent it to Mary Rodwell, uh, and I said, uh, she had mentioned to me as I talked to her about uh, this issue, saying, hey, there is such a thing as a light, uh, you know, a light languages, someone spoke it to me, she says, send it to me, I have some crystal children that speak these languages, and they, and I, I said, Linda didn't, didn't know exactly what the message was to me, uh, but Mary would send it to these crystal children, and I got a response back, which I, this is the interesting part of it, is that, so, I said, so what was passed on to me? She says, well, some of the words have no, no meaning. They only have feeling. So I, I'd never even thought about the concept of a word not having a meaning. And when I, re I reverted back to the first time I met Linda, where tears were strumming down her face, and she doesn't even know what she was saying, it really had some confirmation on the concept. So it was... That, that was, that's something that, that's why I think this is going to be a very interesting discussion on the, on the 14th of May. Okay, maybe um, we have to get a demonstration of this down the road if, if Linda wants to try this. But uh, one thing I want to mention before we go to uh, whoever wants to talk is there's another thing. I, I met up with this um, girl from uh, um, Alaska that we were talking about doing this thing with trying to track down the brain patterns behind um, phenomena like light language and see whether it matches up with um, speaking in tongues. The other thing that we, and, and she'd been looking for me for a year, she'd been trying to track me down and it's like, sort of like, good luck. And so she finally tracked me down. And um, one of the things that she was interested in is something I've been always interested, but I don't have the background to do it. And that is we're looking for people who are, have dyslexia, ADHD, um, bipolar, uh, we believe there's a connection. And she's the academic, she's going to do this, um, she's writing a book and she's, we're gonna work on this. So uh, we have a number of top uh, sort of researchers and experiencers that we do know that have dyslexia. But if anybody on here wants to be a part of that um, study, she, we're gonna look at this aspect that we think there, there's something, there's some sort of connection to people who have this. So that's all I really have, go ahead. I'm just like, How do you get connected to that grant? Uh, you just put um, put a message in the chat box to me, or if you know someone, and um, this um, girl, her name is Courtney, will contact. Uh, we're, we're sort of arranging how we're going to do this now. It would, we may need some funding and stuff like that, but um, uh, she came up with this connection. I already knew this already because I wrote a book called Contact Modalities, 
and I wrote a book called Inspired, where I looked at savant, and savant is another uh, spectrum that we're looking at. Uh, so people who have um, um, the, these kind of spectrums, I already knew from writing on the, the book on Inspired that these people are sort of linked in to, it's same as um, we did this thing with, um, we, had, we had an interview the other night with a guy from um, Singapore, who's probably one of the top experts on light language. And I said to him, I said, so well, how did you get involved in all this? Why, why would you spend your whole life uh, studying light language? He said, oh, I had a, a car accident when I was six years old. I got hit by a car coming out of a, and, and you see this trauma thing where people will look at something like whether it's the virus or whether it's a head injury or an accident or whatever, and you say, this is good, this is bad. And in the world that I've sort of looked at, I say it's experience and that a lot of this stuff, if it's a reincarnation world is planned, that what you'll see with a lot of people who are very psychic or even with people who are experiencers, 37% of all experiencers have had a near-death experience. And the question is, is it a random event? Are you an experiencer and also a random uh, near-death experiencer? Or are these things planned? Are you planning these things? And the idea was that trauma seems to open up the, ve uh, open up the veil. And these people become very psychic or they become mediums or... Um, so the question with the dyslexia and that sort of thing, is this a random event? Or is this part of what this person needs in order to do their life mission? So we're going to look at it. It's something I've worked on it for a long time. And suddenly this girl comes out of, out of left field and wants to do exactly what I was doing. But I, I could never do it because I, didn't, I just don't have the, the background. I sort of know some of the people to look at. But um, you need somebody who's got an academic uh, training. And she's trained, I think, in she's got a master's degree in uh, body, mind, uh, medicine. So she's, she's got the background to do this study. Okay, so we'll leave it at that. Uh, it's at some point, if Linda wants to jump in and show people what light language looks like, sure. we'll, we'll accept that. Sure. Sure. Um, <laughs> Imikatatosorusikante La shield of a mosier, more constant like here, cost the catarchy kishto. Wow, thank you. We, we, I, you mentioned, we mentioned the last time you did this for me that you become very happy. Can you talk about this? The emotion changes when the, when you start to do this? Yes. Well, the emotion changes. It feels like it's number one, what happens No, that time I didn't like have a buildup where I'm feeling like it's a buildup. So it was just a spontaneous pocket. Speaking. Sometimes I feel like it like wants to speak and then I have a buildup and it's like this release of pressure that I get. It's like it's just a release. It's like pressure's coming off of me and then I feel so much more grounded and um, connected to the earth. And so I feel much happier, yes, because I'm having this like valve <laughs> open up. So that's how it works for me. Wow. Oh. And, and you speak about, what, seven or eight light languages? I would say so. It's about seven or eight. Yeah, some is very, um, uh, one is Spanish, one is very Germanic or Hungarian, one is very um, Oriental, one sounds Native American, one can sound very, like, very ancient, a very ancient, ancient language, maybe like uh, Hebrew or something along that line. Something sounds, sometimes some sounds very non, uh, more like the alien, maybe an alien language where you really wouldn't say, oh, that sounds like something I'm familiar with. It's more like has the clicks and some kinds of different kinds of things like that. So they just sort of, again, pop up on their own when they want to. And sometimes there's like a choking as they're switching from one to another, it's like I'm like, oh, 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 and then I'll switch to a different one. So that's how it works, yeah. We had, we had some comments. One, one comment is that brought tears to my eyes. I felt oh. happy hearing that. My emotion changed listening. Beautiful, thank you. So, oh, thank you. 
it, it does it does I, I think a lot of people especially people who've had contact and um, this is a something familiar to you and it means something to you. you feel like you're at home you can feel just really connected to this language yeah I think the, the purpose for me because I I don't mean to be too rational here but you know I had a earned a PhD in theoretical physics and aerodynamics and <clears throat> I was really into the rational knowing and so when this experience came over me to want to open up to the gift of the Holy Spirit of speaking in tongues I was very resilient I mean very resistant to it and I think that's one of the purposes of speaking in tongues is to uh, let their irrational in uh, to make room for irrational knowing uh, in in your worldview and and to learn from that and what I found over the years is that it eventually speaking in tongues and these foreign languages uh, leads you to learn to study how to live the symbolic life how to understand your experiences from a symbolic point of view and not take them literally and you see that tunes out the rational <clears throat> so that, that's just some of my experiences with the subject um just for we have sherry wild on here sherry has written a book called the forgotten promise uh we did a two-part interview with her uh her story is um going to be a six-part series in hollywood uh she's on she wants to make a comment on the light language can we open sherry wilds is she on here still No. There no. I, am. I think she turned out for yes, Sherry. Okay, there's Sherry. Well, welcome, Sherry. You have a comment on light language? Have you done this? Well, I do. If you recall, um, in the interview we did a couple of weeks ago, I talked about how I went in. My doctor wanted me to go in and have this, this whatever that's called this anesthesia. He wanted to reset my brain because okay. I have, you know, I've been poisoned and I've been hit with all this. Uh, mind control stuff. So he wanted to reset my brain. So I, I said, okay, so we did that. And if you recall, um, this, this being, this entity called Maria came through me while I was under the anesthesia and she started speaking and she yelled at them and told them to, to stop that because it was, it was going to kill me and they needed to stop this right now that I wasn't human and I wasn't like them and they couldn't do this. And when I came to, I heard this beautiful language being spoken that just felt like home to me, which is exactly yeah. what it made me think of. And um, I've heard my children, by the way, my children when they were very young used to wake up in the middle of the night and start speaking in this language. Wow. And um, it sounded just like that. So I heard this language and I looked around to see where it was coming from. Well, it was coming from me. And it was this entity, this being who introduced herself as Maria and she said she was there to protect me and that I was being kept in the background. So I was sitting inside my body, sitting back listening to these words coming out of my, my mouth. And it was a language that was very much like what just Linda was talking, was saying. And I was the same thing. I, I felt like I should understand it. I felt like I, I knew what she was saying, but what I got from it was not meaning, it was a feeling. It was, and for me, it was a feeling of being home. It was very familiar to me. And it just, it was just, it was so comforting to me. It was very, very comforting to me. And this Maria was very, was a very powerful being, a very powerful, I mean, what I got was that she was, I mean, she just took charge and she just, she stepped forward and just, she was very kind to the nurse who had administered this to me. She, well, she did scold her. She said, you know, you don't know what you're doing, but I know you have a good heart, but do you know you could have killed her? And, you know, and you can't do this to her and all this sort of thing. But then, then she would slip into this into this language, which it kind of had a little bit of a Portuguese type sound to it, but it was just the most beautiful thing. So I just, I thought you might find that interesting. Um, the anesthesia they gave me, it started with a K, but I can't think of the name of it. Um, but it's a common one that they use to help people who are dealing with stress or, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, that sort of thing. And so it did induce me to speak, well, either me or whoever this was to come through me and speak in this language. It might 
help you with your with your study. So I just wanted to comment on that. Thank you. Uh, okay. Pia Knudsen, who's, who's here from UFO Denmark, is asking, what does it mean to reset the brain? Yeah, I wasn't sure what they meant by that either. I, I've struggled a lot since the poison and the um, radiation and the directed energy weapons that they hit me with. Um, you know, they use a lot of t technology on me and they, um, and also just that I go physically for most of my life. I, I've gone on the ships, and so I go from one um, one dimension to another, one level of density to another level of density, and I think that's kind of hard on my on my physical body, especially my brain. So when I researched it before I agreed to let them do it, um, it basically, I, it, what it's meant to do, which sounded good to me, was to take me so that when I came out of this anesthesia, I would feel more positive and uplifted. And because I've been, you know, it's, it's been a really tough, tough time for me. And I wouldn't say that I'm suffering from depression, but I'm, I, I am suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And I, you know, it's, I get very anxious and there's issues because of the poison, which I'm always detoxing. But it was meant to, he thought it would help me to uh, release some of that anxiety and, and some of the stress from what I've been through. When, when we so interviewed you, you were, you were talking to uh, Chris, the A-level Hollywood guy. Um, who we know, um, you, you were getting healing from him. Are, are you, has your situation improved since we talked to you? Well, you know, interestingly enough, the night when I came back from having that experience at the clinic and they, they took me off of the I think, ketamine or something. Ketamine? Like that ketamine? ketamine. Somebody yeah, saying ketamine. ketamine. Yeah. Yeah. So when they took that out, when they took the IV out and they'd only gotten about a third of it in me or so, um, that night when I came home, uh, I went to bed and I hadn't even fallen asleep when I had visitors and um, I sat up in bed and, and I watched them, this machine come in. It wasn't a ship outside my window, it was a machine and it was about five feet across and it had these bright, this three or four rows of bright lights on it. And um, I was excited to see it. Um, I, I thought, I always think they're coming to take me home. So I was very excited. I was like, I told them they were welcome. And I was going to get out of bed to go over and see if there was somebody there, but I could see it was a machine. It wasn't a ship. And it was landing in my, it was coming down into my sitting, little sitting room. So there's not a lot of room there. So it wasn't very big, but I was going to get out of bed and go over and re check it out and see what it was. But I blacked out. And when I came to in the morning, uh, the first thought I had was they, re they came and they reset my brain. That was the terminology they used. They said they reset my brain. And they did do something because, yeah, I, from that moment on, I, I, my concentration is better. I'm able to meditate. Um, I'm just, I, I don't have the anxiety quite as bad as I had before. So they came, the ET family came in and did something for me. It's almost like they realized, you know, I've been telling them I'm not doing well here. <laughs> I'm not doing so good here. You guys got to come in and help me. But it seems like them seeing me go have this done, it's like it triggered them to finally do something to try to help me themselves so they did come in and, and reset the brain for that but um and then you uh, so the healing actually what i'm doing um grant I'm, I'm very vigilant about doing the dr joe dispensa stuff every day the meditations i do at least one meditation a day try to do two um i'm very focused on on the healing and you know and i do think that it's helping i do believe it's helping yeah for anybody that doesn't know Sherry, she wrote uh, The Forgotten Promise. I highly recommend it. It's one of the best books out there. And you'll see much more. We did a two, two-part interview with her. She goes for two hours in fairly good detail as to what's happened. It is one of those stories that Hollywood just sort of falls over each other trying to get a hold of. It's, a, it's an incredible story and a lot of information as to what might actually be going on. So I appreciate that, Sherry. You're welcome. Thank you. Apparently, Paula Harris is... Starworks USA conference, um, and if we got Paula open, do you want to say something, Paula, before you leave? Yeah, actually, the reason why I'm here is because uh, I was going to share some uh, ET photos with you guys. I was on the Jimmy Church show, and I was talking about a case in Italy, okay. and uh, all the people that were listening to the show last Wednesday, can you hear me? Yes, yes. 
Okay, all the people that were listening to the show last Wednesday uh, didn't get to see the ET pictures, and I, as I'm, I'm on as a reporter because this is not about me. And uh, and Desta uh, suggested that I uh, share the story and all these Polaroids with you guys because you would appreciate them more than anybody. But Grant, I'm here to wish you a happy Easter and to thank you for all your uplifting inspiration also. Okay. So okay. can you can you can you go through this in about five or five or seven less, minutes? Less, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay. I, and yeah, and you and you just to point out for people, you you don't just do people in America. You have you have your conference in November and you have people from all around the world. You bring in you bring in half women, correct? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm bringing in Egon Kregel, who's a rock star, who's written six books on UFOs from Paris. I'm, I've already paid for the tics, tickets of Sisto Paz and Roberto de la Gala, who will talk about changing uh, alien DNA. And then uh, uh, Jaime Maussan, always from Mexico, with incredible photos that he has. And then Vitaly Zakharov from London. So yeah, uh, those are the international people. The story I'm going to tell you, though, is international. And it's, it's found in my books because I do like international research. And uh, I have to tell you this one really fast. I was, uh, Jimmy Church asked me if I had ever seen a photo of an ET. And I said, I have to tell you the story that in 2004, I did a case up in Northern Italy near Torino, Turin. It was a case of a contactee in the French Alps. His name was Maurizio Cavallo. Uh, now, uh, Desta has his photo. He has the most amazing eyes that you've ever seen. He's an artist. He was a follower of Eugenio Siracusa on the island of Sicily, who happened to be, he happened to be uh, um, a follower of Siracusa, who was Aradamski. Okay, so the picture of Modi to Cavallo is, I don't know, can you isolate photos, uh, uh, Desta? Because it's the guy with the great eyes there that I'm standing next to. These are the ET Polaroids that he gave me, but I'll tell you the story. There's the craft. Uh, I'll tell you the story very quickly. I went to do the story and I wasn't convinced. Uh, so I went back three times. This happens a lot. And the third time I went back, he said, Paula, these are people from Clarion. I'm using the word people from Clarion. There is Maurizio Cavallo. You can see him on the right-hand side. You can see his eyes. Um, he said, basically, he said, my family and I were having a picnic in the Swiss Alps. He said, when this craft came down, we all saw it, we got scared, I went back home, and I was personally called to go back in the middle of the night by myself. Now leave that photo, Desta, because that was the guy who was his main contact, the way Ricardo Azantarell, this is Suel. And, and Suel worked in a bank in Rome, and I couldn't believe he said that these beings from Clarion look so much like us, some of them, that they worked in regular places. And he said that Suel picked him up in a, in a black car, and he would bring him to a villa outside Florence where um, they were growing their own vegetables. Most of the ETs that are human that are here are vegetarians, so they were growing their own vegetables there. Even in the Amicizia case, it's the same. And he said, um, the reason why you came back, he said, because he said, Suel, this guy here, said to us 10 years ago, he said, he said to me, there will be an American journalist who will come and knock on your door and you've got to let her in because we call her the bridge. And so what's his name? Uh, Mauri just said, come to my house. I have to show you something. And for the first time in 10 years, he showed the 10. Uh, I have 10. You only have a few of them here if you want to go back over them. The Polaroid of the beings aboard the ship. The no, beings good. aboard the Clarion ship. Yeah. The, the beings aboard the Clarion ship were a federation. That's the little Clarion girl that has the bluish skin. He has a name for her. And there's another one. And these are Polaroids, so there's no way. And he hadn't shown them to anybody. So I thought for your group, because I couldn't do this on Jimmy Church, there's a ship in the, in the French Alps. So he took that photo. That's actually a movie. I've seen the movie of it. It's like a leaf type structure that comes down. I have the movie of it. There's the other ship. And these are, I thought I'd share them with you, Grant, because your, your people would really, here's Swell coming out of the ship. 
um, you know, out of the craft. So he was allowed to take these pictures. And I guess I was the first to see them, but then he asked me to put them out virtually. And I did. I came to the United States in 2005 and showed everybody. And so I've done this presentation of human type aliens over and over and over to try to tell the people that there are also people out there that look like us. They're a little weird looking, but um, that there are people also in, other than reptilians, greys and Nordics, this doesn't look like any of them, uh, you know, that are visiting us. So that's it in a nutshell. And, uh, and uh, Desta suggested I share, uh, share it with you. I, I appreciate you're doing that. And you have to give a message to Jimmy Church from me that uh, video is the way to go. You can't be doing the audio all the time. You got to start with video. <laughs> and, 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 and he's, he's coming to your conference in November, right in, yes, in Laughlin, Nevada? Yeah, he's my MC. Uh, he's coming to the conference. He's going to do a presentation on stage with you. You're yeah. going to say you're coming to <laughs> with you, uh, with you, Lynn Katai. Um, I have Paul Smith, the remote viewer, coming back. I have uh, Paul Hynek. But anyway, it's, it's November 4th through 6th. But what I came on mainly is to show you that we do have Polaroids of, of ETs. Uh, and I saw one that Glenn Steckling showed me of Georgia Damsky lecturing in, and there's a, an ET that looks very much like Val Thor in the, uh, in the audience. So you never know when they're gonna show up. You yep. never know when they're gonna show up. Well, what would you say their main message is? Uh, it's really hard to say that because they come from all over the place. The fact that they want to get your attention. All right, if they're there, if there's a ship, it's not there because it happens to be there. I think I, I've come to the conclusion it wants to get your attention. Then the rest is up to you. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's whatever you want to do with it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's all what right. I call it. Th that's my, my theory of wow. They just want you to go wow and, and tell everybody the story of what you saw. And it raises consciousness, so people start to wonder what's going on. And I'm sorry, well, what's it. going on with you, Grant? Why do you have a female name? Who? You. Me? Sinfriel uh, Wellham? Sinodad Wellham? <laughs> Sinead. Oh, Sinead. No, no. Oh, we have a joint. I, that's my assistant, Sinead, who's on here. And we have a joint account, and she got the account. So that's why Sinead is on there. <laughs> it's well, it's all very confusing it's when you go right. out on it's, Zoom. You know, yeah. Becoming a hermaphrodite is supposed to be part go. of the process. <laughs> That's part of the including, process, yeah. Including your repressed feminine energies and knowing. <laughs> <laughs> it's working for me. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that's anybody want to give a, a comment on Paula or um, Sherry Wild or the light language? Otherwise, we're going to go to the first uh, person on the list here. Well, I don't know who it is. That's to who would it be? <clears throat> um, if no one has any questions for Paula, then she can, I don't know if she already left. But is Sid he's still here? Is Sid Goldberg here from Gaia? Mm. No, I, he yeah, he's here. He's here? Oh, my God. Hey, Sid, come on for a second. This guy's got two Emmy Awards. We've got to put him on here. He's here on the phone. Oh, he's on the phone. But he should be able to... Desta, he just texted me. Oh, okay. He said, I'm listening Shy? to Zoom. I could not sign on. He can't sign on. He'd love to see the pictures. Oh, my goodness. That's too bad. He's from Gaia TV with all the, all the technology and stuff, and he can't sign on. You know, he said he's here, but he can't speak on the phone. He couldn't get on on uh, his laptop, so he's on his iPhone, and he can't. He can only hear. He can't speak. He's yeah, he's really okay. upset with me because he didn't see the pictures. <laughs> okay. Well, he can watch, he can watch the tape. <laughs> so wh who wants to talk anybody just somebody jump in if we have we haven't got anybody on the list so somebody just jump in and talk <laughs> what, about what you want to talk about I'd, I'd like to jump in just for a quick second this sure. is peggy from oregon um so i learned uh, a bit of light language from uh john bertoli a few years ago oh. up at east SETI, and i was wondering if he was going to be part of this group or not so there's another guy who does light language and it's it's incredibly emotional language uh, is the only way I can describe it and I'm not what I would even deem prolific by any means because I I struggle with the fact that I sometimes don't know what I'm saying and so I've kind of let it go there's nobody around me here who does that 
Um, but it was very profound uh, learning it from uh, John. And so I'm just wondering if he's part of this. He's, he's very good at it. We're, we're, we're willing to put him on. Yeah, we're willing to put him on. Okay. Send it, put, put it in the box there for the chat box, the name for Desta. Okay. We'll track okay. him down. If you, if you want to try practicing today, we'll listen to you. There's nobody there to listen to me. We'll listen to you. <laughs> no, I'm too shy. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> so you're saying that this can be taught to people, correct? Correct. Um, I, we were up at East SETI and there was a class. There was another woman there, uh, Candace, but I don't remember her last name, um, who also could speak it. Um, but John was fantastic because he spoke several of them. And like Linda's was saying, you, you jump from one language into another and you can really tell the difference of those different languages. And I was really taken with it, but I, I you know, again, kind of too shy to just stick my neck out there, I think, but uh, <laughs> to do this. Awesome. But um, it, it's very profound, you know, and I, I would love to do more. But I, I also feel like I need to be around people who can do it well. Uh, I think that's a real inspiration for those of us who are, had just beginnings of it. Wow. Well, maybe so. you can show up on the 14th. Well, you'll get an invite. If you're on this list, you'll get an invite for uh, the May, and you can join, and uh, we'll okay. bring in as many light language people, and you may be inspired to jump in and try it yourself, because there's going to be quite a few on. We have a girl by the yeah. name of Lightstar who does 20 languages. Uh, Linda wow. seven or eight. Um, we may bring in this guy from um, uh, Singapore who's doing a lot of study on it, but we've only got maybe two, two and a half hours, so we'll have to limit, you know, if you have that many people on a panel. But uh, I, I appreciate your adding to this. And what you pointed out was something, usually when I listen to a phenomena, I sort of sit there and try to pick up patterns. And I really don't say anything, but you mm -hmm. picked up one of the patterns that I immediately picked up. Uh, Sinead Wellahan, right. who's on here, uh, she had a um, an experience with a, uh, a psychic who suddenly went into light language. And because Sinead has a hearing loss, uh, she didn't pick it up, but I did pick it up that this woman was talking to her and she changed languages halfway through and she went to a different language. And then I know, and then I went on with um, Misha Johnson, who's going to be one of the panel members from Las Vegas. And I'm in an interview with her and we're not doing light language. And suddenly at the beginning of the second hour, she says, oh, I got a message for you. And she starts rattling away in light language and she again changed languages halfway through and Linda does the same thing and this is something that has sort of puzzled me is uh, you never hear anybody sort of doing one language it's sort of they they go and then suddenly it's a completely different language so you pointed this out as well that people will flip from one language to another which is kind of interesting pattern that that you do see over yeah. and over I'm yes curious. definitely I'm definitely Good morning. Hello, Doug. Hi. Hey, uh, everybody. I'm curious about something, Linda. How would you know? First of all, I'm still struggling with English. So that that language is quite amazing to me. How would you know that you're speaking it well? Like when someone said someone who speaks it well, like if we don't understand really what it is anyway, what's a what's a one better than another type of thing? Thank you. I, I've had so many questions about like language myself, and I've been to a class where a woman has had it and did teach it. And I, I had to ask her that question too. It's like, and, and what's the difference? And I mean, if someone learns it spontaneously or if someone's taught it, what's the difference? And what she talked to me about was the fact that you know, this is really a frequency. We're talking about frequency. So everybody who's speaking it is going to come from a different frequency and we are in my mind we're waking up codes in you when you hear a light language from me you're going to get codes from me i'm like on coding certain pieces of you but you can get something else maybe let's say from hildegard and you'll be she'll be affecting something else because she comes from a different vibrational frequency it could be even another uh soul group that's connecting with you and so it's going to mean something different to you and a lot of different pieces of you that's kind of how i feel that it works so i don't know if you can say they they, they speak well or they speak differently but they speak a different vibrational frequency so i think that's where the difference was and that <clears throat> made sense to me it reminds me somewhat i've been studying the seth speaks material recently as oh. grant knows and there was a there was a section in in his talk about um, about written word like the writing on the page, and he was saying where is the 
where is the intelligence in the writing? It's obviously not in the marks and it's not in the, in other words, it's in a bunch of multi-dimensional ways of knowing language that are just not the way we were taught. Like it could be in the vibration of a letter. It could be the shape of the letter. The letters together without even knowing what the word means could could have a vibrational effect on us and it gets multi layered and 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 it's it's just one of the thoughts i had about relating it over to uh to it's it's a phenomenal thing to hear and it's almost like oh come on you're making that stuff up but i know i could never do it you know i know i could never do it because and and i know when i hear it i know that it's it's authentic you know but it it almost makes you want to say it's just nothingness you know Right. Well, what I noticed with the, the, I, the first time I did this, like kind of publicly, I was in uh, Wisconsin at this Northeast Wisconsin uh, spiritual group. And, and I went around and I left a message for everyone. And what I heard back from people was, I could feel that, you know, they told me I could feel that. And these were people I wouldn't have expected would have been able to feel anything. I mean, like some people I can like sometimes my hand will be vibrating. Some people will feel that the next person won't feel a thing. So these weren't people I would have thought were sensitive enough to feel that vibrational energy, but they were telling me, man, I could really feel that. Man, that's what I really noticed. And thank you for the message. It was really, so that was profound for me because I don't know about it. I didn't know about light language. And so I'm learning about it kind of as you all are learning about it. And that's kind of strange. I feel like this other lady when I first started speaking it, I forced myself to stop because I thought this is just stupid because I'm saying this stuff and I don't know what I'm saying and it would be coming up all the time. So I forced myself to stop. And then um, I've had these like channels and people talking to me about language and the effect of this language. And so it re and then I said, well, is it this light language that and or this language that and they're like, yeah, that's it. And so I reincorporated it in like two years later. And so now I've been working with it and I've been trying to be, now that I'm coming out of the closet about the whole abduction experience and uh, contact experience and the light language experience and getting stronger in the fact that if someone wants to make fun of me, I think that's one of the hardest things coming out about any of this stuff is that you're vulnerable to people making fun of you, right? And so I had to get strong enough in myself and who I was to the point that if you wanna make fun of me, I can deal with that, right? That's that's what it takes to come out and do this kind of stuff. That's why it's hard to do, especially since I was a businesswoman at one time and I used to make fun of people who were into this kind of stuff. So I had to overcome my own bias, you know? My own bias was that people who were doing this stuff were weird, and but my memories had all been suppressed, but not the trauma of it, which is, which is in uh, the interview I had with Grant, if you want to know more about that but uh, it's been a process just to love self enough yeah I think that's an impressive part of it because if someone like I know when I run into someone that has nothing to do with a particular belief and then they're converted so deeply sort of like a person that will tell about a near-death experience and then they come back from the near-death experience and their life has changed. Now they know there's a continual life. Now they know there's God. They like have a total awakening. I'm always fascinated with stories like that, not to knock anybody else on the other side, but more than when someone's been following science fiction and UFOs since they're a kid and it's their hobby and everything like that. And it's like, uh, if you know what I mean, because it's like it's like a real one-two punch of like, well, what's, what's the benefit of doing this if it's not genuine, you know? So I'm very impressed with someone who has those kinds of uh, uh, amazing changes. And uh, so thanks very much. That was great. Thank you. Linda? Yes. Uh, this is Paul. Linda, thank you so much for bringing out uh, your information there. I, I have had several instances where I was speaking light language. I didn't know what it was. But it would come in, I'm a, a body massage therapist and body worker, and I would go in and, and work with, with uh, clients and bring in their, i say, you know, bring in anybody you believe in or anybody that's your guides or teachers, and they would come in and we'd be working away, and then this language stuff would come through. And most of the time I would, wouldn't say it because it's like, this is weird. But sometimes <laughs> I would. If I knew the client well enough, then I would just bring it through. And 
sometimes I would know it was a feeling thing. And a lot of times, it, like you were saying, it just bring tears to my eyes when this energy, whatever it was, is coming through. So it's very, very powerful. And but I didn't know what it was. So just your speaking today uh, brought all those pieces together. So thank you so much. Thank you. See, that makes me feel really emotional. I mean, the <laughs> fact that you said that, because I'm hoping that by me sharing this, mm -hmm. that other people can connect to their own truth and get comfortable with something that might be a gift and start to feel free to use it in healing because it's a very powerful healing tool. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. you're helping people and it's coming to you because their guides and your guides have asked for it. So to get the strength and the courage to reveal yourself um, and take a chance. Yeah, so that's cool. Thanks. Linda, one more thing. One more thing. Is there like audio uh, recordings of this that are posted where people could like at night listen to a group of these? Right. Things? You know, that's what I was talking to. I would really love to put together a little bit of uh, YouTube or something like that so I could post things for people. I have a lot of recordings that I've started from the beginning about this. And in fact, I listened to one of my earlier ones, which was very oriental. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's and it was kind of fun to listen to them. So that would be neat to be able to do that and maybe have other people contribute to that it would be fun. So thanks, great idea. Thank you, Doug. Well, my experience with it is, was the language yeah. was an attempt to get me to change my consciousness, to be open to a different reality. So it was meant to be a healing encounter for me, uh, but, I don't, I don't know if you're into healing methodologies like Paul is down there in Oregon. I guess the gift will work through you and uh, speak to you in the process of opening you up. But it is definitely something other than the rational mind that's coming through. It's more the instinctual, irrational knowing, the emotions, the feelings, the intuitions, the sensations. Uh, opening you up to not the CNS knowing, but the vegetative nervous system knowing, which is completely autonomous, like a dog. It doesn't think about what it's about to do. It just reacts instinctually, like it's following a pattern. Uh, so that, that's what I get out of it. But just I'll make a quick comment before anybody jumps in. Um, somebody made a comment in the box here, I think is valid, is you can compare this to music, the emotional uh, impact of pieces of music. It's all vibration. Or there's an interview we're going to do with this Tress from Scotland where she talks about visual clues. You'll hear a lot of experiencers talking about the fact that they are activated by symbols. And she walks around, hers looks like a key. And she's carried this key for her whole life and it's a symbol that activates her so whether it's symbols that are activating you or uh, a language or whether it's music it's uh they have ways of of activating you without the rash sort of the rational way that we have to do it through language and and you've got to go to school and stuff like that they seem to have all sorts of other ways to activate people and to move people into another sort of dimension or whatever they're doing Anybody else want to jump in here? I have a quick question for Linda. Um, wh what are your thoughts about clicking sequences? Um, I have a 12 year old daughter who um, I, it woke me up about 3.30 in the morning and she was doing this really elaborate clicking sequence and it pulled yeah. me right out of a deep sleep and I had chills over my whole body. I had just returned from a trip at Mount Shasta doing contact work, and um, and I had this really powerful experience. Um, it lasted for a few minutes, and then that was it. But I, I'm going to tell you the first thing that came to my mind. Am I, on, am I still on speaker? Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is I don't know why I'm going to say this mantis, uh, and I don't know why I'm going to say it, but it's like it feels like mantis. Click, 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 click. I had the, I had the same reaction, Linda. Yeah, it's yeah, been, yeah, really it's strong. Communicating. It's the instinctual realm. So, yeah. you know, follow, follow me, follow my knowledge, follow my way of knowing. And yes. Then, and then think about it later. Yeah. Well, I had the, uh, as a 
kid, not knowing I was doing the clicking thing enough, enough that the kids or other kids and family were saying, will you stop that, You're, it's embarrassing. Until I heard it again from other people, it was the Mantis people. I was picking up, copying one of them, not just copying, and I can still do it. I don't think I'm saying anything, but uh, it's interesting. Yeah, I'm gonna also put in another confirmation. It definitely is like the Mantis people when they talk. So I, we're all on the same page. It's very cool. Very cool. I wanted to add, I noticed something that for years I had a high pitch sounding like a thousand crickets cricketing in my ears. Very high. Every All the time when I go to bed, I listen to it. And it had a sweet effect on me. It wasn't something that was like, Tonight, it's like, I got to get rid of this thing. It's going to drive me crazy. I kind of liked it. And finally, recently, it changed. It's the first time it's changed in years. And now it's just a singular, very, very high-pitched tone. Very, very sweet, high-pitched tone. But it's no longer that, that creak, 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 like that whole rhythmic, like as if you're listening out in the field to thousands and thousands of crickets. And another thing that's changed is I used to hear in total silence in my head, not outside. I used to hear what sounds like furniture being moved around. Furniture in my room being moved, like a, de a dresser drawer being closed or a thing being shoved or a thing being moved here and there. I would hear it all the time and I'd be like, what is going on with, what, with the furniture in my brain is being, <laughs> being moved around or something? And that seems to have stopped now. So I don't know if anyone else has inner inner uh, ear brain stuff in quiet time at night when they're sleeping. I don't know if anyone else has that, but I thought I'd throw that in. Hey, uh, yeah, I want to share here. Carl, it's amazing you bring this up about this clicking. I did the same thing as a kid. I was also clicking too. I forgot about it till you mention it. And I do have uh, Mantis experiences. So it's like, whoa. And then, uh, yes, Douglas, I do have those high pitch tones as well. Yeah, we we both do, and we talk about it all the time. And it does change. And I love the sounds of crickets. They, they're really suiting me. They're really, really supporting me in my vibration. So anyway, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, Kim, um, I, uh, I also felt Mantis. Um, Pam Dupuy, who Grant and I have both met with, uh, who has flown craft. Actually, I think Grant would admit, probably the first person he talked to that actually uh, and it's quite an experience. Uh, she's explained it, I think, on one of our one of our recordings. Grant, I'm not sure if you posted it on your site or not. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, interview, but she's definitely connected to the Manus. And uh, she taught when I I've met her many. She passed away two years ago, but um, I met her many times at her house, and we went through hours of discussion. And definitely. Uh, the mantis she was directly related to, and the clicking was definitely part of the mantis. So, I it's like when I when I heard you say that, it, yeah, I'm not sure if you saw my head, but right away I, I that was definitely a mantis. Click. Well, there's a wonderful book by uh, Vanderpost, uh, who wrote about the Bushmen in Africa, and the title of the book is A Mantis Carol, C A R O L. And the Bushman always said that the mantis brings one the big dreams and shows them how to live. And in this case, I think is trying to help us see that we become too one-sided in to our rational knowing and we need to learn from the irrational knowing and the behavior of something as simple as a mantis or an insect or a dog or a cat, you know that kind of thing. Just get out of the head and put more psychic energy <clears throat> by meditating and that's how you'll get in touch with it. You know, in, in, in my town in Hoboken, New Jersey, uh, David Huggins lives here and he's a very well-known experiencer. I think maybe some of you will know him. He's very accessible online. I every now and then get together with him and he all in all his paintings, he's quite an artist and in all his Experiential paintings are mantises. Mantis is the big being that comes to see, comes through the, he tells me, he's told me that the, he'll lay in bed 
and he'll wait and a little hole will open in the wall and things start to come through. And then he starts to have this relationship with them and it's been going on all his life. And he's the most unassuming man. He has no interest in being a star or anything like that. He, he, you know, he's just, he'll never tell you anything about it unless you ask. And if you ask, he'll tell you. And it's just all his paintings. If you ever want to see Mantis paintings and the kinds of things that he experiences, that's David Huggins, H-U-G-G-I-N-S. I'd like to uh, offer that um, it seems so almost related that uh, I did some ethnographic recording of a uh, tribal historian in the Coos tribes in Oregon and um, some Northwest, I'm aware of some Northwest native languages that used an awful, uh, a lot of clicking type of sound in their language. And this tribal historian was very active in uh, wanting to restore the language because it's you know all but lost. And um, you know, I have it on a cassette tape and I might try to figure out how to uh, digitize it so that can be shared. It does, you know, it's not exactly like what we're all talking about here, but you kind of wonder about native and tribal and indigenous people around the world and so much of uh, their wisdom and what they have to offer is becoming more and more re relevant. And so I just wanted to insert that for a second. Has anybody seen District 9? Because that science fiction film, which is far out, is like the clicking in their language of those, those, uh, those uh, uh, mantis type beings. Are ama it's amazingly similar to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. That scene, District 9. Enrique, you want to go? I see you want to talk there. Um, uh, well, oh, you're, oh, yeah, I thought you wanted to talk. You're unmuted there. Oh, sorry, my, my mute, I'm not mute, right? Okay. okay. I, I was thinking about language and I, I don't think it's a random expression because um, we tend to see words as kind of like creating a slang and then becoming uh, an agreement of the social group and then language. But I think that a meaning precedes the apparition of vibration and words and language itself. I was thinking about the encounters with um, aliens. At the moment you have the exchange, the telepathic exchange. Um, I, I have a feeling before my mind translate those feelings into my language, in Spanish in this case. So uh, I, I had the, the experience of those feelings to be whole, complete. And the language was actually limiting the expression of the feeling. So um, I, I feel that um, our languages, either the, the languages we use in the planet or the languages of light that uh, you guys are mentioning, are frequencies lower or higher, but it's still frequencies. And behind that, there is meaning that is complete. Um, I was thinking that not by accident, I met uh, Dr. Jim Herta when I was in my 20s. And I was working with him on the uh, correction of the translation of the Keys of Enoch into Spanish. And that was a very interesting experience uh, because um, accessing all those uh, texts that he had in the, in the books of Enoch, I remember something from my teenage years. I, I woke up repeating this weird language that I didn't understand. It was like a recitation, like a mantra. And I was always curious about what was it. And eventually I realized uh, reading from the um, books of Enoch and talking to, to Professor Hertak that it was a, a sutra from the Buddhism. I think it's the Heart Sutra. Uh, for some reason, I knew parts of it. Uh, I think it's in Sanskrit. Uh, I thought it was Tibetan, but it is Sanskrit. And somehow it's there, the meaning. I, I get too close to that meaning because it's about void and emptiness and how emptiness is formed. And those are themes in my meditations from those years. So maybe 
it's like we are putting our antenna up and just taking those meanings and and maybe language is not as random as we think. I remember reading about this mathematician, Stan Tenen. He discovered that the platonic solids, if you pass light through one of them, when you are inscribing inside um, the torus, the, um, it's called the, the Fibonacci sequence in a three-dimensional form. You put it inside the tetrahedron and you pass light through it, and you are gonna see a shadow in the wall, and the shadow is probably one of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And if you know, if you are a mathematician, you can put the, the tetrahedron in 22 different uh, symmetrical positions, and you get the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And if you go for another um, a solid, uh, maybe a cube, you're gonna get other languages. And so languages maybe are not random. Maybe they are expression of the vibration or the solidity or materiality we are inscribed in right now. And maybe those light languages you guys are mentioning are exploration into that potential because the, the void is, yes, it's empty, but it's also potential of meaning that we can access. So we are in a way pushing the boundaries uh, breaking with the formal language into the exploration of these other things. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Um, is Lori here? Can you, if you're on, Lori, can you link on here? We had that discussion with Singapore the other night, and that's what I heard him saying. I thought you could explain it better, but if Lori's here, the thing about if you turn the, the, the letters, it, it, um, creates the 27 letters or whatever. Do you remember that? Is Lori on here or no? <clears throat> I don't think Lori's here. Oh, she was, well, okay. Question, if I can this jump this was an expert guy on light language. He was mentioning exactly almost what Enrique was saying, this thing about if you shift the, the letters this way, that way, it creates all these different things. And this is what the light language is doing, the written light language is, is really weird. And But it, it, he's sort of talking way over my head. I don't understand. Uh, he was explaining it. He's, Can you he hear me? He was like 14. Go ahead. Yeah, just go ahead, Sid. Oh, great. Um, so uh, thanks for having this group and uh, being here with uh, so many fascinating people. On, on the topic of light language, uh, I've been exposed to it maybe just a half a dozen times with other people doing it. Either they were some kind of energy worker and, and projecting it onto me or... Uh, what was interesting was one person in particular looked at those Mexican artifacts with all the ETs and UFOs carved into them. And uh, th that person was never exposed to them before. And he went into light language. He doesn't understand it himself, but his partner um, did an interpretation of it. Um, but, and when other people in this conversation mentioned mantis beings and stuff, in the contact experiences I've had, it's always been a telepathic, in my own language, experience. So when I hear about the clicking and the light language and stuff, I don't really know where to put it in relation to what I've been exposed to. So I thought I'd just put it out there for people. Maybe you can just mention a little bit your experience with the mantis, because you have a pretty dramatic experience, and you weren't a UFO guy. What's that? You, can you describe your mantis experience a little bit? Because you weren't a UFO guy. You just sort of like, and he said like you were him, that sort of thing, where he sort of blew you away. Right. So uh, just essentially, uh, this happened uh, during a very uh, powerful meditation that I'd had in 2009, maybe. And I've been meditating since I'm a teenager and lived in India for nine years. So I've... I'm very familiar with my process and the kind of cool experiences I may have been exposed to, but nothing like that. So I was shocked to be out in space seemingly with some beings, and I didn't know they were mantis until afterwards, friends who are more into the UFO world looked at the uh, pictures that I had sketched, uh, and I worked with an artist to depict it because it was so uh, powerful. 
and present. And to this day, it's it's as more present than some of my three dimensional encounters. But um, but it explained to me that we had been together before and will be together again because I was them. And I thought this is very interesting because in all the years I used to sit with my guru and we used to talk about reincarnation, it was always referenced at one time years ago that there was a whole universe of multiple dimensions out there, but until I can really function properly in 3D, I sh we, we wouldn't really discuss it. So for me, it was a, an experience that was very validating in a certain way because uh, one, I had never um, had an out-of-body experience that uh, brought me to encounter other beings that were not human, and two, that the concept of reincarnation for me was terrestrially based. And here he's saying, no, we've been together uh, in the form of Mantis previously, and we will again. So I thought this is new information for me. So perhaps it's very authentic and real. Um, but like I said, the information was telepathic in my own language. So when I hear the, the half a dozen times I've heard the light language, I honestly uh, felt it hard to relate to, uh, even though I was in a receiving sort of mode at the time. And I thought, well, if, if beings want to communicate, why would they use their language and not one that we can directly communicate in? Um, I have a thought. Linda, do you want to jump in on that? Sure, sure. I have a couple of thoughts about this, Sid. One is that I do believe that the mantis communicate with you uh, through telepathy. Absolutely. And uh, I, I also believe that the clicking is, to me, it feels like, uh, do you, like almost like a purr, like a cat purrs. And, and a cat can communicate in different ways, but a cat has a purr. And, and, and it's almost like the mantis have a, you know, this clicking that goes on with them. Almost feels, and I don't know, again, I don't even really know where I'm getting this, but it just feels like I have this in me. So I'm going to say what I'm feeling. Uh, it feels like, it, like, like this light language can calm me down. It's almost like it's a, it's, it's a, it's a calming kind of a, ah, oh, that's how I'm feeling. I, and, and maybe other people can talk about if they get that same sense, it's like a, uh, what they do in their language and not commu communicate with you and human, but to communicate in their language, in their tones, and, and that this is what they do. It's part of what they do. It's just a sound. Well, in my experience, I think it's a phase I went through because I no longer and prompted to speak in tongues or try to interpret tongues. So, but I think the phase was to get me to open up to another reality. And Sid, it seems like you were, from your experiences of living in India, already were open to another reality. So it's a phase that you maybe didn't have to go through. Thank you. Perhaps, I don't know. Uh, yeah. I Go ahead. Uh, I guess what I would try to say is that no one, I don't know that we have answers. I mean, I'm not trying to say that I have an answer to anybody. We're all trying to sense and feel because a lot of us don't know. We're trying to piece things together. And as a group, I think we're able to piece a few more things together. And I think the reason that the light language, and, and, and I've talked to a lot of channels about that. Like I said, I stopped saying it because I didn't understand it. And I talked to, you know, I said my brother, I talk, the first time I talked to a channel about it, I said my brother made fun of me, not fun of me, he made fun of people who spoke in tongues. And so while my brother was making fun, like pretending to speak like language, I spoke, or, or, or in tongues, when my brother was uh, pretending, I spoke like language, and he stopped, he turned his head like this, and he sat there like he was in a trance. And he was there for quite a while. And then he sat up and he started talking again like nothing had happened. So 
I never said a word about it. He never said another word about it. But something happened in that, in exchange. And like I say, we don't have the answers. I don't have them. And I can only tell you what I know, what other channels have told me. They all tell me this is not even like speaking in tongues. This is the one said, no, this isn't speaking in tongues. This is different because it has this energy of um, the DNA and helping people to remember. So that's what she told me. So I keep being told these types of things. It's coming from Cryon. It's coming from all these different channels mostly and then it's my own feelings my own results when i work with this language in a healing mode and i connect into people so deeply and it's like oh my god when i'm in that mode when we're really connecting i am connecting so deeply with them and seeing their soul it's profound and there's so much respect that comes out from this language to that person and so much honoring it's like when that happens it's like i love them so much and sense all that they have been through in this reality to be who you are in this reality and how hard it is for you to be here in this reality and there's so much honoring and so much thankfulness and i feel emotional now <laughs> so I wanted, to see if I, could, I wanted to see if I could say something back to Sid, what Sid, I said, and what Sid was saying earlier. And this brings Walter Rucker down on the bottom there. I see you into it a little bit because we had a great uh, drive by on the topic of um, reincarnation. And Walter gave me a thought I never really had. And, um, and I don't know if anyone will relate to this, but uh, we were talking about the fact that uh, uh, out-of-body experiences and that, you know, you had previous lives and you'll have numerous lives coming through this incarnation into other lives. But Walter reminded me that there is no time. Time is an illusion. And time, if time is an illusion, <laughs> I'm still thinking about this. If time is an illusion, then there really is no future life or past life then they're all all together at the same thing. So it's hard to, it's very, very hard to fathom the idea of everything is, everything is at once because in the, uh, you know, the book by Richard Martini and, and, uh, and um, Michael uh, Newton and all the, all the books on, on uh, reincarnation and out of body experiences and everything maintain that the people that are leave their body and go to that, that loving place that's absolutely incredibly loving, there's no time. Then nobody's in any time. There's no sense of time. Everything is oneness. So if everything is oneness, then there is no linear past lives and future lives. Is that, what does that make sense or, or not? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I often uh, have shared exactly what you've said. And uh, the confusion for me personally is that if, I've had, let's say, perhaps a, a very deep meditation and I'm coming from that zone a little bit more than being very grounded with my feet here uh, in the world. I feel more in contact with that. And yet, so predominantly, we are uh, expressing through a 3D um, level of confusion, it would seem. But uh, I had another light language question um, because something uh, Linda said uh, reminded me of that. And uh, because a, a couple of the other experiences I've had also of um, contact were also telepathic, which may be just my language in particular with anybody outside. But um, I've also noticed that all the people I know who do what they themselves call light language. Um, for my novel ears, it sounds a little bit like speaking in tongues. And all the people I know who are doing the light language come from uh, an upbringing in the Christian world. So I'm wondering if the filters that we sometimes project onto situations, if they may be colored by somebody from a strong Christian upbringing, because at least those are the only people I know who have talked in light language. And I was wondering if there's any perspective on that anyone likes to share. I'd like to jump in on that really quickly, Sid, because um, 
I'm not Christian, was not raised Christian, and all my experiences have been through uh, a traditional indigenous uh, pathway. And so I don't have that preconditioning. Um, so I think that that may be for some people, but that's definitely not across the board because there's a lot of Christian references. When people start talking, I, I don't know them. I don't get it. And that's okay. I'm not expected to. They don't understand mine either. But um, I think that's a good thought, but it's, it isn't across the board, just to let you know. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Well, I also wonder, since Gregory is, a, I, I think, Gregory, you're a Christian Pentecostal is what you told us, and that you had a UFO connection. And so I'm wondering if maybe the light language, even in the Bible, isn't connected to UFOs, because who knows who were the gods of the Bible, if you really come right down to it. I, I wonder about that. Maybe how many of us here are questioning who, who were the gods, because they said, well, you know, the God came down and, you know, and, you know, and then went back up and talked to these other gods that were up there. And so it's kind of a, if you really look at the Bible closely, you got to wonder what is the UFO connection in the Bible. And uh, not that long ago, uh, there was a interview of uh, one of the interpreters at the Vatican saying that the Nephilim were, you know, they, they're not gods, they were humans. And that's all in the Vatican in the records there and he was interpreting that and so we got to wonder so light language speaking in tongues ufos where is the connection right i'm connected to the ufos gregory's connected to ufos he speaks in tongues i'm calling it light language maybe it's synapses i don't know yeah you're referencing um, Ma Ma mauro bigliano Yes. The interpreter for the Vatican of the original Dead Sea Scrolls. And then from his literal interpretation, there would be another version of it that got published as the updated uh, Bible, uh, I guess the King James Version. And uh, he gets very passionate on the topic, as I've spoken to him a few times, that he said nowhere did he see God in the singular, it was plural, and that these were... Uh, perhaps not only beings that came to earth, but they are us, or we are them, is always been his contention. Thank you. Well, let me address uh, Sid's question. Yeah, I, I was steeped in Roman Catholic upbringing, uh, 12 years of parochial education. Uh, so yeah, I, I have that uh, bias, if you will, to take to it. And when, when this experience happened, I was, attending mass with my wife and two daughters at Holy Trinity Parish in San Pedro, California, uh, when, when, this ex when the experience happened. And uh, roughly, it's real quick to share, this orb-like white entity uh, touched me in the shins on my legs, both legs. And I immediately saw an inner vision of this orb. And uh, and I noticed it had a slight little tail on it, so I wasn't wondering what that was about. But anyway, the entity uh, quickly came up into my body and dwelt in my chest area. And it, it began to uh, give me the sensation that I was being vaporized and I was going to levitate. I was going to start to float out of the pew. And at that point, I became a little concerned. Uh, but I later understood that to mean this is about your subtle body development uh, and you should take it in that vein. Well, of course, that took God since 1976. It probably took me 20 years before I even let that uh, finally get a hold of me and sink in what, what the experience was trying to point to. But anyway, then it went up into my head, uh, through my neck, and up to my third eye. And the pointy part... Uh, tried to come out first. And so the, the, the bulk of it, the, the orb, had to shrink. And it was like it was having a hell of a time getting through there. And, and so I think that's when my third eye was open because it eventually went through. And it went up to the rafters, the apex of the church, and out over the top of the altar and disappeared. So I, I couldn't help but think, uh, my God, that 
it's a UFO, it's a flying object, it was unidentified, <laughs> you know, and so, but eventually, you know, it happened in Holy Trinity Parish, it has to be the Holy Spirit, uh, and so it went from there, but uh, that's a long explanation, but there it is. I'll just add one thing to this. Um... Leo Sprinkle was the first guy to do abductions back. He was at the University of uh, Wyoming. Um, he did a bunch of studies on abductees, and he maintains absolutely that as a psychologist, uh, you manifest what you believe. And so if you're a lot of fearful stuff will be start with grays. And I've known this and has never been brought up by anybody except for me is that very, very rarely or if ever, someone who has one experience with the same being their entire life. It changes. It's one being and then it's another being and it's another being. It's almost like the beings are sort of handing people off to the next set and then they take over you and then they give you something else and you go to somebody else. And Sprinkle said clearly that you, it's almost like John Wheeler, the guy who won the Nobel Prize in physics, said it's a participatory universe. And the fact that that in a, long, a lot of ways we have to realize that we're manifesting what we're seeing, that uh, there really is no physical world, it's all consciousness. So Sprinkle said that, and then uh, Dest and I had, and, and Sherry Wilde has had contacts with this Chris guy in Hollywood, uh, and he only became awake a couple of years ago, and what the being told him was basically the same thing, was the fact that um, you, when, when the beings come to you, they look in your brain and they see what you've got. And they use whatever. So if you're in fear, they'll use fear to teach you a lesson. If you're in love, they'll use love. Whatever you, you, whatever is in your head, they can't give you something that isn't in your head. So they're basically just taking the thoughts that are in your head and creating a parable, almost like Jesus in the Bible, and presenting you that thing because that's what you're going to do. So if you believe in the devil, uh, your higher self is going to manifest the devil because if it comes as anything else, you're not going to believe it. And uh, so I think that's where we, I think we have to always remember is that we are a factor and you get even things with, we think, well, it's gotta be like a, a voice where they tell, it talks to us in an English language in a sort of a left brain rational analytical way. And you start looking at experiences and you see these really bizarre ways of, of, um, of talking. We're gonna do this Ron Johnson guy on Tuesday night. His first really dramatic experience was where uh, the beings are coming and then he says they take this giant salamander and they stick this giant salamander into his face. And if you know this, Doug, you'll know the story with Chris Bledsoe. When the, um, just before he, had, the, the night that he saw the, the, the Lady of Light, uh, these beings gave him this thing that was like a package of sausages that were hurting his hands. And he was to carry this thing and he was to keep care of this thing. And he wanted to put it down and they said, no, you've got to care for this thing. And he hides it in the, in the dog cage. And so when you look at aliens, you start seeing, or whoever they are, you start seeing these very bizarre things of using especially symbols almost like Bashar says we come to you in your dreams because now you're in our world and I would my my just my take on it is they're very right brain they're very female brain they're they're not very left brain they're using symbols they're using very right brain things uh, to put across messages and it's not we want the left brain rational analytical just give it to us write it down give us the free technology and get the hell out of here and they that's not what they're doing they're more in the in the right brain using symbols doing dream stuff. A lot of people say they get it in dreams. And uh, so that's just my take on it. The ground. Well, in my situation, I was learning this, or I didn't even learn it. I just spoke and I was told that these are codes because the left brain machinery operates within a very limited frequency range. And for me to activate my, or let's say more of my DNA, these things, even if I'm alone in the room and I start speaking these three letter words, which I've tried to write them down, it seemed to be no more than three letters that I'm familiar with in our alphabet. And as Linda said earlier, it makes me feel good. Sometimes I know what it is I'm saying, sometimes I don't. Most of the time I don't know. But then I'm also getting that I'm not supposed to know because we speak, we are creators and we speak everything in our life, whether it is physically visible by others and they can confirm it, this is a glass of water or not. We speak everything into existence because that's the nature of who we are as creators. 
And so that's my take on my particular way of light language and what it's supposed to do. It's an activation for me. And if other people on their deeper level resonate with it, that's great. I don't insist on wanting to logically understand it because I don't. I have no explanation for it. I would like to say something. Yes. Um, uh, hi, Enrique. <laughs> yeah, Giorgio from Peru. Are you in Peru right now or in Florida? No, I'm stuck in Miami. I can't return. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I'm just holding on, but it's okay. Um, well, I was also thinking that there are different uh, symbolic languages that we are entrained to, to express uh, uh, from a higher level to the outer world. I'm talking about music, dance, uh, images. I'm talking about uh, mantras and also the, 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 the tongues that we, are, we were talking about. Because we already have in our constitution this connection with these higher um, levels of reality, ontological, real uh, levels of reality. And all, all, when we have an intention to, to connect, we, we, we begin doing it automatically. And what happens is that the environment begins to change. What uh, William Tiller, the physicist, would call the uh, gauche symmetry begins to, to change and we, 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 we call it vibration, raising the vibration, right? But what, it, what is probably happening is that um, the density of time is, is uh, increasing and everything is becoming more simultaneous and available to the mind, which is how we would naturally operate in these higher ontological levels. But if, it, it doesn't require this kind of understanding to do it. What it requires is to do it to be willing to be focused and with a sentiment. And the focus, uh, this contact field, the gauche symmetry is raised and, and these beings have an easier time communicating with us as well. If I could for a second there, Sinead uh, Grant. Um, the, uh, you mentioned Bashar. And he was doing a QA and a in one of the sessions and somebody walked up and was asking him about particular things in the Bible. And the question got around to, well, tell us what you know about the uh, Israelites uh, leaving the, uh, the Egyptian land and wandering in the desert and whatnot. Uh, and what was that all about? He said, well, what particularly do you want to know about? He said, well, they supposedly followed a God or a light or however you want to interpret that passage. He said, no, it was an ET ship. And uh, the guy said, it was an ET ship. He said, yeah, it was an ET ship that led them out of Egypt and they followed it and they thought they were following a God because they didn't know any better at the time. And uh, <laughs> the guy said, well, why did they wander around in the desert for 40 years? I mean, couldn't they figure out where North was? And uh, he says, <laughs> he said, well, you know, when you got a God that's led you out of captivity, you're going to follow him around wherever he goes. He said, well, that's why they wandered around. It's because they just wandered, watched this ship. And they just kept going where the ship was going. And they just kept moving along, you know, various ways. And I'm certain that there were probably physical experiences that they were having. And they were, you know, working out their new civilization and all that other stuff. But it was kind of humorous. And, and I thought it was interesting because when you do look at the Bible and you and you look at some of the things like the, the plural of gods and the and the other parts of that still are unexplained today, you start plugging in extraterrestrial contact in there, well, it starts to make a heck of a lot of sense. Well, I, I would like to make a comment on that, Walter, because <clears throat> the uh, in a way, we are in the Exodus experience. We are suffering a second exodus from uh, being slaves to our too rational way of knowing. And, and we're going to wander in the desert for 40 years in order to get our souls purified and rectified and reconciled uh, before we really understand just how much one-sidedness we have incorporated into our lives and how it dominates our whole agenda day in and day out. And um, so I, I think the 
Exodus story is a beautiful story. They needed 40 years uh, to wander in the desert to get the, uh, the, the psychological uh, indoctrination of, of being a slave out of their psyche. And, uh, and we're in the same damn way. We're, we're a slave to rational knowing. Uh, and I, I, this is one of the, I'll give you the modern example. And it's, the, it's the reaction to the coronavirus. It's all rational. It, there's no irrational way of, 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 of thinking about it, of saying, well, wait a minute, uh, 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 life at all costs? Who ever heard of such a thing? Shoot yourself in the foot, you know? Uh, chip can your entire global economy because you want to save a few more lives? This is insanity. This is not following Mother Nature, the irrational way of the goddess who gives life and takes life. I mean, wh who the hell do we think we are? Gods? No, we're one-sided rational beings that are driving that stake deeper and deeper into the soul of mankind with all these unfortunate, unintended consequences. And so, yeah, let's, let's take on Exodus too. Let's wander in the desert for 40 years of our soul and see if we can get purified. Sorry. But I, would, <laughs> I would add that it's, the rationality doesn't have to contradict the mother way. And the mother way is not irrational. It's more loving and inclusive. What, it's, what we have to evolve is our rationality to be more inclusive of love and of the universal patterns. Yeah, I would Our agree. It's very irrational, actually. It's very limited. Yeah, I agree, Gorju. We, we got to really start erring on the side of meditating and learning from our dreams and our visions, our inner world. And uh, we, we got a lot of catching up to do. And so when you go into that irrational world, into the timeless world, into the eternal realm, which is really where we all journey when we journey. Uh, Sid, uh, somebody else brought this up. You know, we're, uh, are we in a time-bound world or is it a timeless world? Well, guess what? We live in a time-bound world. But when you psychically journey into the other world, you, now you're in eternity. You're where the ancestors go. This is where we're going. What we're doing is preparing our souls to be able to know how to be with the other realm by being irrational in our approach and being open to learn from the irrational. So anyway, there's that to be said too. I think you framed that really, really well, um, Gregory, and in and, and all the things that you've covered and specifically in reference to, uh, I think what Walter was saying when he spoke about the Shar and uh, following a UFO out of um, Egypt, um, I was pursuing that line of questioning with Daryl Anka and uh, I was actually just writing about it yesterday and he was saying um, that a lot of that information he was not yet ready to release for some reason. Uh, the details about that and um, I just sort of went on to the next thing without sort of challenging that because uh, he, you know, he was speaking as Daryl Ank and not Bashar in that moment. But he said it would be interesting for the pursuit of that questioning to continue. So uh, I'm, I think that's something that will be revealed down the road a little bit more uh, in terms of, I think, thinking people may not be ready or so. No, he never talks in that way. So I, let me correct that. He just said there was more to reveal and it wasn't the time. Could you post his name on the sh chat box? Or is there a way to read about what he thinks? He's Bashar. He's the Daryl Anka ch channels Bashar, the famous uh, alien channel. Oh, okay. Daryl Anka is his name. His his cousin was Paul Anka, the singer. Oh, I see. Uh, what, did he give you anything uh, exclusive you can tell us here, Sid, in your discussion with him that that was new? Um. I don't know what's new or not because I haven't been following him for years. Uh, it was all new for me because I'm, I'm relatively new to what he's offering, but I had some specific questions that I want to integrate into something that's related to ETs in the Bible. So hopefully um, when I put it all together, it will be released on video. Beautiful. 
Is there any other subject someone wants to bring up? We're up to two hours now. Anybody have any events? Because as, as I said when we started, uh, Winnipeg has gone online. I don't know if the uh, the uh, Phoenix people have gone online, but there you're going to see more and more uh, UFO groups going online, and you can join in. Uh, Toronto goes. Uh, was it Hildegard, first Wednesday of the month? Uh, actually, we are now on every Wednesday. Every Wednesday, okay. And we have Roberto on from Peru. Uh, he'll speak to us via interpreter. Okay. Can Can you put your uh, um, your name in the in the chat box for everybody so that they can, if they want to link up? Uh, Winnipeg does second Tuesday of every month, and I'm not sure. Is there any other groups on here that are going online that people can tune in to whoever they're bringing in? Sunday. Oh, who's the doggy? Who's dog? <laughs> It's mine. <laughs> uh, Grant, uh, I, I talk with Phoenix Move Fund, yep. and uh, they're going to have about 20 people that they're going to send inv invites to, so I'll be forward oh, wow. reporting it to them. Um, they're not going to do Zoom meetings. They're only doing impersonal meetings. Uh, okay. In-person meetings, not impersonal. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Yeah, I was supposed to be there in September, but I don't know if with their, how long they're going to be canceling it, but... Um... Phoenix is a big group, same as Orange County is a big group, but Phoenix can bring in 200 people to a to a meeting. So it's good that they're going to sort of join us. Any uh, anybody got anything else, a sighting or something? I, I would like to share something. Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Um, April here. Hi. From, hey, April. March, from BC, right? Yep. Como Smiley. Um, March 11th, I was sitting here in my living room. I was around. 9.50, and all of a sudden I got this uh, feeling of an SOS. I had to go outside, SOS, so it was like something was wrong. So I ran outside, and over the forest, I saw this very large craft, the size of uh, like a sea king. Um, but it was not a search and rescue vehicle, it wasn't any of the inventory that I see around here. And so I ran back in the house to get my cell phone, and I took a couple of photos and I'm watching this thing and it is very large and it's over the trees and it's going like this. I have, I have a, I did a drawing. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, you're an artist. People should know you're a very good artist. Thank you. Um, so anyways, it's, this is in my backyard basically. And there's a big uh, second growth old forest in the back and this craft was above it. And it was very strange because it had three large lights in the front and they were yellow and red. So I'm taking the pictures, I'm looking at this thing and I don't recognize it. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, this blue orb came up from out of the top of the trees and went whizzing down into the field. It was really large, it was about 12 feet. And um, it shocked me. And I right away messaged a friend of mine saying, oh my God, I can't tell if it came out of the craft or did it come out of the forest? Anyways, I have really bad pictures of the craft, but I'm able to interpret um, what I see really well. Okay. So this is the craft. Now, it made no noise, so I don't think it was a helicopter. I really don't know what it is. Wow. Um, but I have photos, and they're very bad, and that's why I took the time to actually do the drawing but it had three big lights in the front and um it, what was bizarre was it didn't make any sound and like i have how if i have a helicopter over my house i really know because everything rattles and shakes believe me um you're this, right by comox the the air force base right i am yeah 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 so i in my neighborhood i just see a lot so is this one of our inventory? I don't know. I'm just, you know, presenting the facts of what happened. But about the communication thing was, you know, I was quite comfortable in my house, had absolutely no reason to run outside. And that's what happened. So I'll send those photos to you, Grant. Good, or yeah. And, and sometime when you come on, you can talk about the crash. You were perhaps involved in a crash of a flying saucer. So. We oh, can yeah, come on. That was, that's that was what number... into all this. What's that? 
That's what got me all into this. Yeah. yeah so sometime when you come on, we'll t tell that story and you can tell people it's kind of interesting. You're right by a base and you may have been involved in this and government involved. And it's actually a very interesting story that probably isn't out there. Most people don't know this story. Yeah. <laughs> Well, are you yeah. in BC? Is she in BC, Grant? Yeah, she's oh. right outside Comox. Oh yeah, I'm in Victoria. Yeah, and there's she, a lot she, going on around here. I can assure you, I have many, many photos, and there is a form of communication happening because why would I go outside and take photos? I know they're in my house, and I go by feelings, and for me, it's like kind of like defense. I'm going to get your photo and then I can prove that I saw you, you know, yeah. that's the way it works for me. Yeah. Well, I think it works for everybody, even yeah. Mark. And, <laughs> I think I, that's where I have the theory of wow, where they tell you, come on outside. Mark can tell the story. You can probably, he's, maybe people haven't heard it. Mark tells the story about the same thing. He's told to go outside and the thing comes flying by and he's got his laser. And um, I think that's the way they do it. It's like, and that's why I always say the theory of wow, that you sort of look at it as a random event, which I think is wrong. And the prime example is the Nimitz. They have this object sits there and hovers in one spot for a week until they finally chase it. And as soon as they start to chase it, it drops from 80,000 feet down to, to sea level in seven eighths of a second. Now they don't need to do that. I mean, they're doing that to show off. I mean, and this is what they're doing. They're just, they're trying to get people's attention. They want you to tell the story. They're doing all this weird stuff. And if it's not weird, you're not going to tell the story. They put people's clothes inside out and backwards or back on them. And so they, and leave marks on their body and stuff. And um, I think this is like, this is how they communicate. It's not necessarily through language. They're using, as Enrique can tell you, they use a lot of imagery where people are getting images in their head and you use them as sort of like antennas and, and who's getting the image, what images are you getting? The event we had last August with Enrique was uh, the one guy we were following, the one guy, and it was basically, what was the image? What was, you know, he was getting images in his head and we we're trying to figure out what does this image mean? What does that image mean? What are they trying to tell us? It's it's not as clear and left brain as people would like it to be. Mm -hmm. George, you want to talk? Oh, oh uh, Grant, I'll, I'll just tell April this and uh, quite a few of the people, I guess, from Winnipeg yeah. have heard the story, but I was watching a movie called uh, Knowing which is about ETs coming to take children before a major solar uh, storm hits the earth and burns it uh, to create Armageddon. Um, so I, I was, I'd been watching it for two hours and 45 minutes. Um, I all of a sudden got this thought in my head. I said, time to go out and star watch. So <laughs> I'm, away from, I'm at the lake in Pelican Lake in Manitoba, August 10th, uh, sorry, August 31st at 1045, uh, 10.45 at night. Uh, for those of you who want a remote view, you can ac actually go to uh, Pelican Lake, August 31st, 2010, uh, and sort of see if you see something at this point. But um, I will tell you that uh, I grabbed my laser out of the house and walked out with 15 minutes left in the movie I've been watching for two hours and 45 minutes. I told my wife I'm going to go out and, and do some star watching. And I said, why don't you come out? And she said, well, we've been watching this movie for two and a half hours. Why are you going out? I said, well, I, don't, I just feel like going out and star watching was a nice night. So I grabbed the laser, walk out, and there's this bar of light, 80 feet long, 20 feet high, and about 30 feet wide at the back, going by my, my uh, we've got a low profile cottage by the lake. So as I walk out, there's this bar of light, no openings, no sound. It's about 200 feet away from me. Uh, I pull my laser up, and it's a green laser I, from me to, uh, the computer right now, I could bust a balloon with it. That's how powerful it is. Um, so I point this green laser at this craft and I shoot it with a craft. And about a millisecond after I do it, I thought, why did I do that? I can't imagine why I just shot that thing with this laser. And it turns after it goes by me. Like I say, it's going by me at very slow, five kilometers an hour. And when I shoot it, it turns and goes Star Trek on me out away from my wife comes out of the cottage because I'd yelled at her to come and see this thing. And uh, um, that was my experience of, I know obviously I, I look at it now and know that I was called out to, to see it. Obviously. Okay. And now give them the punchline, who was in the craft? Punchline was, it was me sending, it was me sending a message back from my future to uh, begin the process of hunting UFOs and, you know, learning more about down this rabbit rabbit hole, um, which basically has led me to consciousness and all the other things 
craft is quite secondary right now to all the other really important and interesting things. As Grant, you've gone through so many genres and so many stages of this experience to know that this is such an incredible journey we're on. And if you open yourself up to it, you seem to go down many paths and find out a lot of interesting stuff and meet some fantastic people like yourselves. Yeah. Well, you met yourself in the future. That's yeah. right. Yeah, well, that supports Carl Jung's uh, notion that uh, the UFO phenomena is about being our souls. It, it means that it's um, a part of our soul that we have yet to consciously integrate. And uh, so it's a very interesting experience. It's a good example of uh, maybe how that happens. Oh, I, gotta, I have to give another quick, quick example of, uh, of interesting stages in life. And uh, one was about two years after that, I was in my house where I'm actually at right now. I have a low profile access to, I live on a river in Winnipeg. And um, I was reading a book by uh, uh, Romanek and uh, I was in a chair by the window and a light, this is that, it's, that it had just gotten dark and um, a light was coming through the window and I looked out, out the window to, to see what it was and it was a giant orb. Like I'm talking 20 feet wide. It looked like, I described it to many people. It's like gasoline on water turning. Uh, so I ran upstairs, I was yelling at my wife who was already outside looking at this thing and we were watching it and I ran in the house to get a to get my phone with it to, so I could take a picture of it and uh, when I got back my and you know three or four or five seconds later my wife said it just this is after watching it for about 30 seconds it disappeared as soon as I ran out of the place to uh, to get my phone so about uh, six months later I was at a I was at a party and a lot of people that know me know I've had these some of the experience and they they say hey I hear you've seen a UFO and I I, you know, I'm not shy to tell people, yeah, no, I've seen them, and I start describing them. So my wife was standing beside me at this party, and I said to the guy, yeah, it was this giant orb. It looked like gasoline on water. It was turning, and the guy, my wife turns to me and says, no, it wasn't. It was a metallic craft. We were 75 feet away from this craft. It was over the water, like just outside our deck. And uh, at that point, I didn't realize, you know, I was thinking, I wouldn't ask my wife what she saw. But I just found it very interesting to see that she saw something totally different than I did. Yeah, and and then that's the key. Is sometimes you hear experiences talk about the fact that they believe that they are related to the people that are doing whatever it is to them. That they and and the, the idea is, are we them and are they are or are they us? Are we all one? You know, uh, how much are we manifesting what we're actually seeing? When you when you and your wife see something completely different you start to understand the fact that it's not as simple a world as people think it is. It's not, it's not going to be just simply aliens in little tin cans that have got lost in space and ended up at earth. It's yeah, I'm, I'm thoroughly convinced it's going to be way more complex. And I would say much less physical than people think much more spiritual than people think, and lots of people aren't going to be happy with it. So what color was it to you, Mark? It was, uh, I said, like I, it was not, a, it was like opaque, but it was, uh, it was like gasoline on water. I mean, so very, was, like, was it like a, a rainbow of colors in or? Yes, it had multiple colors in it. And it, it wasn't a consistent blend. It was, it was actually, a, obviously I thought it looked like it was turning, but maybe, maybe that's just the way it, uh, it functions. But my wife said it was a totally metallic, a totally silver metallic type of, of craft. Yeah, well for you though, the, the message seems to be the rainbow bridge uh, and the subtle body as you know, the primary seven chakras, uh, you could color each letter in the word rainbow with one of the colors in the rainbow, starting with red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet, and white. So uh, something like that might be the message, I would think. Could be. It's, I mean, it's an interesting journey. And uh, like I said before, craft are one thing, but uh, the experiences as you connect other things like bumping into Linda Green and then talking these languages and leads to uh, you know all the people I've met throughout my life now since since really since 2010 and this experience um, have led me to incredible experiences. Grant and I had one where one of the people in our group talked about her uh, her experience and her relationship with this other being 
And we were doing it at Tim Hortons in Winnipeg. We walked out and they were in a craft right above and she goes, well, there they are as we walk out of the place. And there's a craft. Well, I'd have to explain, that's actually a very poor explanation of what happened because my jaw was on the floor for about two hours of this discussion. And as we walk out, I just said, I looked up at the craft and said, we're just friends, just met her, you know. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, so I don't know, this, this is such an interesting thing. And that's why I look forward to these type of things that Grant puts on and, and our group uh, that does on, hopefully all you can join us on Tuesday night when we, when we talk to Ron Johnson, that's gonna be very interesting. Yeah. If anybody's got any questions for Ron, um, send them to me or to Desta or to Mark or whoever, you, and they'll get to us. Uh, he has an incredible story, and it's very involved. Uh, he's got a book coming out, but we'll um, we'll go with that, and we'll stop at it now. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming. And um, we will probably have this every two weeks, so if you want to join again, and um, if we find any more events that are around, we'll sort of let you know. So you you can take a break from watching TV and cleaning the house. <laughs> you cleaned the house, Mark? Come on. Thank you. Hey, Grant, just one quick thing. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. your true identity. It's Grant Cameron. There you oh, go. Right. <laughs> go ahead, Walter. You got something final here. Yeah, so the, uh, it's a, I, I really enjoy these meetings. Thanks for having them and, and thanks for having me. But I've just got to say, if nothing else happened, to come and watch Kim Forth smile for two and a half straight hours. Yeah. It's, it's worth it to me. So Kim, yeah. you look great. Hi Kim. You, you can come, uh, Walter, you can come to uh, Shasta. She has she has some exercises. She can make you do some exercises there. And and that was the, the time when I was ready to take off. I go, I didn't come here to do these exercises and stuff. But, but Kim is, uh, is a gentle soul and I, I uh, appreciate what she did there. Very high energy soul, and then I guess I'll lead, lead with this: is that what happened? We taught you and I, Walter, talked about this thing about vibration. We're talking about uh, light language and how it may activate and raise vibration. And in your sort of an expert on on uh, seances and what happens there, and you need the vibration to be lifted. And the same thing happens at the Enrique's event with these CE five things, the Mission Rama protocols, where you have to raise the the energy. And Kim can tell a story that once we had that event in August where uh, the circle sort of broke up and people started leaving in cars to go up the hill because they got this message that there was going to be a, an encounter up on the hill. Uh, the energy just dry, dropped off in that circle. And poor Kim is trying to raise the energy because she was supposed to be running the uh, the ceremony that was going to take place. And and so anybody that doesn't believe that, that, that vibration is part of this, I can absolutely guarantee you from that experience, vibration is a big part of what's going on here. Yeah. Grant, I already, I just also figured out, sorry, Kim, go ahead. No, no, that's okay. I agree 100% with Grant just said, yep. Yeah. I wanted to add that I didn't realize until just now that all the women in this genre that are interested are gorgeous, yes. and all the men are so goofy looking. <laughs> <laughs> you know the set too, right? <laughs> that's why you come on here, right? <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. If this was an all-male group, I'd never come. <laughs> Okay, thank you everybody for showing up and we'll see you in two weeks. We'll you get an invite. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Greg. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Mark. See you. Thanks, Destra. Bye, Paul and Mika. Bye bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Great stuff. Bye. Thanks. Thanks for organizing. Bye. From Pia. See ya. Bye, Pia. Bye, Candace. Bye, Desta. Bye. Bye, Jan. Bye, Max. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>